Sports Talk Chicago. Gilbert Johns Glue, John Meadows directing and producing. Great to be on all of our great TV and radio affiliates. 98.3 The Life, WKAN 105.5 The Ticket, ACTV, JTV, WJOB, and City's 92.9 Talk FM. We had a lot of Bears talk in segment one, and we're going to have more here in segment two. As we have our guest joining us for another segment, Mark Potash. He's the Bears beat writer for the Chicago Sun-Times. And he's covered Chicago's media uh, for Chicago sports for 30-plus years. And, Mark, it's great to have you back here for the second segment. We were just talking about uh, Hallis Hall and what the Bears have done uh, in 2023. And maybe you can answer this question for me. Uh, based on everything that we saw throughout this season, there was so much chaos. There were things going on off the field, things that didn't really go amazingly well on the field, like the three blown leads inside the fourth quarter, the things that were historic for the Bears in terms of losing why did they decide to bring Matt Eberflus back? Well, I just, uh, well, I guess because that's Ryan Poles' guy. And I don't think Ryan Poles, after year two, wanted to kind of, wasn't ready to admit a mistake or, or acknowledge it or say it was a mistake. And, and I think he was looking for reasons to keep his guy. Uh, the, you know, the the comparison I use is, is the 2012 when Phil Emery was in his first year and had Lovey Smith. Lovey Smith wasn't his guy and the Bears went 10 and 6 and he fired him. Well, Phil Emery was looking for reasons net to fire his guy. Uh, Ryan Pulse is looking for reasons to to keep his guy. And in year two, I get it. I mean, uh, I always say, you know, the year two uh, of of uh, Eberflus was much different from, I think, year three of Nagy when uh, when the Bears had already were already on the way down. And and they kept him in that year, and and I, I don't think it's a, it's a similar situation. I get it in year two. I kind of think in general. I mean, I know I'm saying two different things when I said, oh, they should have hired Harbaugh. But on the other hand, overall big picture, I'm more in favor of more giving coaches more uh, a longer leash in general. I I think that's I know that's kind of old fashioned, but boy, there's I just look at I keep a chart of uh, of all the coaching hirings and how long they last and. Man, there have been like 15 coaches just in the last three or four years who have lasted, le- not even gotten three full seasons. So anyway, I don't mean to get too far off track, but I think in general, coaches should get a, a, a longer leash. Uh, um, so I so I get that. So I, I, I get that's why he kept them. Um, I guess the thing with, with, with Eberflus is he hasn't really done much as far as a head coach. And right now, to me, his strongest suit, frankly, is that he's a good defensive coordinator. That's his biggest thing he's got going. The one thing he did was, I mean, that, that when things did go wrong, he kept the ship together. He was good. I mean, and and that's to his credit. But as far as all the other head coach things, um, higher, you know, he's he had, he had lost two, uh, well, fired coaches. I mean, there's been coaching, assist the assistants, all sorts of things. Um, he he hasn't really proven himself, but but I get that they want to give him another year to prove himself. But it's just it's just such a difficult thing because of you want continuity, but um, sometimes it's better to make changes. So I guess I, I don't really know how to answer the question, obviously, because I'm not, but my, I, I guess, I guess I'm just saying that Ryan Poles had his guy and it was going to be r- something really worse than even they had to happen. It was going to take more than that, I guess, for Ryan Poles to change from his own guy. I heard on the radio after and the you know, end of the season. Like, you, yep, go ahead. You, you can win with Matt Eberflus. You can win you know, lesser coaches than Matt Eberflus have won the Super Bowl and have gotten to the playoffs. And, you know, he's not a disaster. You know, he, he's not. <laughs> he, he did look overwhelmed six weeks in. I am 100 percent. But he did recover from that. And so what I'm saying is it's possible that he can grow into the job. Yes. Would you want the, the next Kyle Shanahan or Sean McVay? or whatever. Yeah, of course you would. But the Bears have, don't have a history of knowing of having the intuition to know who that guy is. So I don't blame them for for keeping for staying with Matt Eberflus and at least trying to create they have a they have a chance. This is the arrows pointing up. That's the difference. The arrows not pointing down. The arrows pointing up. That's the reason why they kept Matt Eberflus because they have a chance to make a good coach out of him whether or not he makes them a, a better team. It's happened. It's part of the NFL. I mean, I think that is a good way to put it uh, in order for, you know, people to understand why they would keep them around. You know, I heard, and I was going to mention this earlier, um, on the radio after the season, I know you brought this up briefly too, I heard people saying that through all the turmoil at Hallis Hall, which, as you mentioned in the first segment, was kind of brought upon Eberflus by, by his own doing, right. it allowed him to keep everybody together 
It allowed him to grow into the role more, and it actually effectively helped his case to stay. Uh, what do you think about that rationale or part of that rationale in terms of retaining Eberflus? Well, I kind of wish there was more supporting evidence to keep him, like, I mean, like, you know, just more wins and just, you know, better overall play and, and winning you know, not collapsing in some of these situations. I wish there was, but I, but I get that. And, and, uh, and uh, boy, it's funny, you know, after what was it? It was right when they got sweat just before that, when they fired David Walker, the running backs mm-hmm. coach. And at that point, that was the second coach who had had a human, human resources <laughs> issue. And, um, and it just, he just looked and and it also, and a part of it also is, is image. And he did not, he does not project well uh, media wise. He's not good at that um, in a lot of on, a, on, mo- on many levels. And so and he was really lost. He did not give he did not have good response. He did not handle those well. And he's going to have to learn how to do that better because there will be rough waters again. Um, so. So, yeah. So I, I think I, I guess that's reason enough. I mean, it could have it could have. It could have gotten worse and it got better. So I, that's again, when you're in your second year and it's your guy, uh, that's going to be a bigger reason uh, to, st- to kind of stay the course. Mark Potash still with us here on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark wanted to shift gears a bit. I know this is a passion topic for you and I, the Baseball Hall of Fame. The recent results came out. Three guys got in. One guy, my guy, came three votes short in Billy Wagner. What was your take of the results that came through? Well, uh, except for one guy, I guess, I feel like it was just another uh, acknowledgement that this is really becoming the hall of very good. And, I love it. And and it really and it really is. And, and when I say that, I, it's, I, I can't remember how I put it. I think I said it has become the hall of very good, but not intentionally, but almost organically or naturally, because the more players you enter in the hall of fame with every player who comes in after a while, when you pick it every single year, it widens the pool of players who are almost as good as that player. And so naturally there's going to be a dilution of, you know, the very first one was five absolute hall of famers, you know, uh, uh, you know, Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and, and, and uh, Christy Mathewson and that group. And, and those were guys, all time greats. Now we've got, instead of all time greats, now we're getting guys who are re- who are the best of their era. And um, I, I think I've always said this, I, I'm, uh, you know, you know, we've talked about it before that the Hall of Fame should be much more exclusive than it is. And it should be uh, th- there are two ways to do it. You could do the, the best of all time, best for any era, or you could do just the best of their era. And you can't it'd be too exclusive in the former, but it's too diluted in the latter. You've got to find a happy medium. And uh, I'm actually kind of uh, in the process of trying to recast. I feel like to recast the Hall of Fame and go over year by year and, and just get it, have, see how exclusive, how, see if I can hit that sweet spot of who should be in and who should not. And um, it's very, it's really difficult. But, uh, but uh, yeah, the way it's going now and you're seeing more and more uh, um, of players, I'm trying to think, you know, uh, I can't remember who this opened the door for. But I've, you see it all the time. Well, so and so's in. I can't remember. I can, you refresh me on who even got in. I can't even remember. But um, yeah, but, for this year, for this year, it was uh, Helton got in. Adrian Beltre, which I I would Beltre agree with. Was, Adrian Beltre's Beltre. your Hall of Famer. He, yes. Beltre's your one. Yeah. But the others were and guys Mauer. like maybe it was Helton. Somebody they well, if he got in, what about? I can't remember who it was. But anyway, that you're always going to have that. There's always so anyway. It's a natural, uh, uh, a natural. Uh, thing with the hall of fame and that's my argument i don't mean to be antagonistic about it um but i think because i think it is natural i think but i just think i i guess my point i think the hall of fame should be more exclusive than it is i mean and that includes leaving out guys that uh, i really like like harold baines and you know ron santo and you know whatever so uh you know so anyway that's yeah that's that that's it i think the question was what do i think about the hall of fame uh, voting this year that's that's, that's what I feel. I think it's becoming another step towards it becoming more and more like the Hall of Very Good. I'm just waiting for the day that they somehow justify Chase Utley getting in based on war, Mark. When that day happens, I'm going to lose it. Well, there's <laughs> going to be actually, yeah, they're, they're, we're getting to the point where there's going to be a lot of those because they compare favorably uh, to some of the guys, to more and more of the, every year, more and more of the guys are getting in. And um, I guess it's not maybe as big a deal because those are all really good players, but I just feel like these I, I feel like we're getting more players who, when I, um, this is my own, uh, the, my own way of thinking. And I don't know if a lot of people agree with me to me, 
a Hall of Famer is a guy who I knew was a Hall of Famer when I was watching him play, not over accumulating numbers over a period of years. Now, maybe people don't see it that way. But, you know, when I saw Mike Schmidt play or Willie Mays, I saw Willie Mays and Hank Aaron. Every year I saw them, I knew they were Hall of their How many Hall of Fame seasons do you have? You know, that kind of, I guess maybe that's probably the, the, the criteria. So, um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, I just think it should be more for guys who have Hall of Fame seasons. Uh, and I think we're getting away from that. And like I said, not intentionally, but just kind of the way, just the natural uh, course of, uh, of, of picking Hall of Fames. Well, Hall I Fame remember, and I remember when I was a bit younger, you know, watching guys like Todd Helton, uh, Joe Maurer, Adrian Beltre is a different story, but especially Helton and Maurer, you know, you'd watch programs, you'd watch them play. Nobody really would come out and say, hey, I think that guy's going to be a Hall of Famer in 15 years when he retires. But now all of a sudden, it seems like the balances have turned, that the scales have shifted. And 10, 15 years ago, these guys weren't even coming up in Hall of Fame discussions. Now today, they're in the damn Hall of Fame. It, right. it just It's really stunning the right. reversal of, of um, maybe the storyline or, or the perception around them over time. I think so. Yeah, I think that's that's it's that's just kind of the natural course, the way it goes. Like, I think you're going to see guys who I think were guys who were once thought of as Hall of Famers who tailed off, but had Hall of Fame starts to their careers, like Don Mattingly and Dale Mur- Dale Murphy is going to get in now, and he was there was no chance like ten years ago. But now with everybody else getting in, his numbers are looking better and better. The start to his career, and you can say, well, if he just would have stopped when he was thirty. You know, he would have been a Hall of Famer. I think guys like that, and I, I, I'm, I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I favor guys who had at least a Hall of Fame. Like the ultimate example is Sandy Koufax. Now he's way off the charts, uh, uh, good, uh, great in that. But guys like that, I prefer those guys who had Hall of Fame starts to their career or, or a good Hall of Fame, uh, you know, chunk of their career. Uh, like Dale Murphy was a two-time MVP, and Don Mattingly had also had you know a great start. And I, I like those guys better than the guys who played like 15 years and, you know, hit 280, uh, you know, and maybe were top five in MVP once. You know, I mean, that's just my own opinion. If you, I'm not going to uh, argue. If you, if, you don't, if, you, if you don't feel that way, that's that, that's fine. It's, it's good debate. I agree with you. I, I think it's becoming way too big and too many people are getting in for just no reason. I mean, the next person who's probably going to get in is Andrew Jones. He didn't have, even have 2,000 hits and – as you probably remember, his career spiraled out of control once he signed with Los Angeles. That was a big three-year, I think it was a $71 million deal. He had a buck fifty-eight, and they cut him. And the rest of his career, he was a pinch hitter, you know, on right. the White Sox, Yankees, other places. Never really got his footing again. Somebody like him, though, is probably going to get in but that's uh, another guy. Who, years. Yeah, that's another guy who had the great, uh, a good start and was, uh, you know, on a Hall of Fame trek at one point in his career. And... Um, he wouldn't be in my ultimate <laughs> Hall of Fame if I was like re- when I recast it and I, you know, and it's just the guys like, you know, Ty, Ty Cobb and Mike Schmidt and uh, what have you. Uh, but but uh, given the current environment, uh, yeah, I, I, I can I can definitely see that happening. When you watch baseball today, is there anybody who sticks out to you as being a legit Hall of Famer, somebody being in that elite category that you think is going to get in eventually? Well, let's see who are the who would be the lock guys. I mean, Mike Trout, and even he's having the tail off part of his career. Yes. He can't stay healthy, but obviously his numbers. He was just so dominant, and kind of the Stan Musial thing, where boy, if he had played New York, uh, he'd be he'd be in the Hall of Fame already. You know, they put him in early. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, Stan Musial is a uh, is a guy who like was you know I was on the West Coast for that era, and uh, you know has the same uh, underrated Hall of Famer type of thing. Trout's like that. Um, I mean, that's one guy for sure. Uh, boy, um, let's see what happens with Otani, huh? Um, that'll be interesting because uh, what now he's now he's hurt, and will he pitch? You know, will he pitch again? And and what happens? But he's had a great start. So I mean, uh, just for being, just for doing the Babe Ruth thing. I mean, uh, that's you know, it's fame, fame. It's a Hall of Fame. He certainly qualifies there already. Uh, if he can sustain it, uh, he's certainly there. But I'll be honest, I'm not in baseball mode. I haven't really looked at all the names. But those are the, you know, those are obviously two that, that, that uh, come to mind, uh, you know, off the, off the top of my head. I'm sure Definitely. you can come up with some others. I'm sure I mean, other guys, but yeah, I mean, off the top of my head too. I don't know how you feel about this, but uh, Verlander and Scherzer, I'd say, from a pitching perspective, are probably yeah. the better oh, pitchers. They have three thousand strikeouts. Season and stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. They're all. They're all. They're all going to get, it, especially with the way it is now. <laughs> um, what you got to look at is how many guys who maybe you don't think of as Hall of Famers. Um, 
you know, who are going to end up with uh, with numbers, um, you know, or Nolan El- Nolan Arenado, he'll be in there, right? I mean, look at the with his defense and offense and right. all the big numbers he put up in Colorado. Uh, you know, that's the other thing is when you you know you look at some of those, uh, you know, Helton, another guy who got in um, with the, some of those inflated numbers. Now, I think Helton, I think he had like a he even had like an over eight hundred OPS on the road. So I, he's legit in my my opinion. That's not it's not like the guy who won, who's the guy who won the batting title. I can't remember his name from Colorado, but anyway, um, you know, had like hit like four, you know, 400 at home and 200 on the road. I think it was uh, Charlie Blackman, right? There you go. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Look at his, look at his home road splits, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, you'll see, you know, Arenado's going to be, he's in, he's, and he's legit. Um, not, not, I don't think all time great, but the, the best for his era by that standard, absolutely. He's in. So that's another one. There's a lot, there's a lot. That's what, that's why we're talking about this is because there's really more guys than we know who are going to be in consideration. But again, the whole issue is just how, uh, uh, just how uh, bloated is, is the hall of fame. And I I'd say very, and it's a tough argument to make because you're denigrating people who really had great careers, but it's a hall of fame for a reason, you know, and, and how much exclusivity should there be? Um, I, I think there should be more than there is. You know? Well, I love the argument and that's going to be the line of the night for me. Who do you not think's in the Hall of Fame, or who do you not think uh, should be in there, but will get in eventually? Right? Like we're sitting here watching right. baseball today, uh, looking around and thinking, "Oh yeah, you know, who cares about that guy?" Kind of a blip on the radar. Ten, fifteen years later, they're going to be in the Hall of Fame. We're going to be wondering what the hell happened. So. Well, the other thing, John, <laughs> is the other thing, John, is that the game's changing. That's true. And, and and so that's that's really difficult. And I'm older, so I really don't even have a really good grasp. I, I'll ad, I'll admit that a hundred percent. I really don't have a good grasp of of what it means to have to be 12 and 13 and win the Cy Young award and, and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and even, even, even offensive numbers and stuff. And a lot of things are, are skewed. I this is another thing I kind of go by, you know, go, looking back at like some of the, the steroid numbers and stuff is like, not just having like 40 homers, but how many times were you in the top five in the league? You know, we're, you know, that's one of the things about like talking about analytics. Well, an, one big key is analytics, like OPS plus ERA plus that's a, that's a measurement against the rest of the league. I think that's probably the biggest thing is how, how many years were you in the, were you in the league league leaders? That's why Ron Sano, I think is a better hall of fame candidate than people give him credit for. You look how many times he was in the top 10, he played an era where there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a, it was a, there weren't a lot of, you know, 40 home run guys. And, and you look, he was in the top 10 and you look it up and in, in RBIs and home runs. And even, you know, that's a guy who led the league in triples or had, he was up there. He's a triples and home. I mean, that's a guy who's, who's been in top five in several categories. I think that's more, it should be the more of the standard is, is, uh, is, is how many times you were among the best in the league and how many times you were, and how many times you're like in top five and MVP and stuff. And I don't know, maybe they do still, maybe they do uh, use that uh, as a measurement more than I think. But I, that's how that's, I would lean more towards that than a lot of raw numbers or things that anything that's really accumulated. And Mark, uh, before we finish up today, last question, I'm going to go back to the Bears here and I'm putting you on the spot. So forgive me if it's a little bit too personal of a question. But what do you think the toughest question was that you asked at a Bears press conference this year? The toughest one? Um, yes. boy, that's, that's hard to say. Um, probably, uh, just the most recent one was, uh, asking, um, asking, uh, Ryan Poles, if he talked uh, to Jim Harbaugh <laughs> when uh, Matt Eberflus is sitting right next to him, you know, I got to deal with Matt all next year and he's, you know, he'll know, he'll know I'm the guy who thought he should have been canned, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, or thought they could have done better. So Matt's a good guy. So I don't think he's going to hold it against me, at least not outwardly. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was kind of the most awkward thing. Um, um, but, uh, you know, that's, you know, I guess that's part of the job. So I, I have to go look at, uh, 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 there were several things, obviously with the, um, uh, with the way the Alan Williams thing was handled, I think asking, there were some questions about that, even at the press conference, um, that were probably difficult or awkward or stuff like that. But um, anything that addresses the elephant in the room, uh, you know, is always is always tough to do. And, you know, the Bears are a lot of elephants in the room. They need a bigger room, you know. So, uh, but, they, yeah, that's just that's just a part of the job. And I admit I don't handle those as well as probably I should sometimes. So I know it looks awkward and very cringeworthy, I guess people would say. But, unfortunately, it's the only way I know how to do the job. I don't think they're cringeworthy. I think they're great. Uh, personally that's why i love having you on because you're you're 
you're telling the truth, man. You know, you're coming on here and you're talking about a lot of different things. And I always value and appreciate your opinion and always value and appreciate having you on the show. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. Always, thank always you, appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on. 